to do the recording properly. But so we're looking at John Milton's Areopagitica, uh, which is the first, uh, to my knowledge, the first defense of free speech in any language, and certainly in the English language. Uh, it was the context was Milton was writing to the parliament of his day to rescind uh, a, licen a licensing order that they had uh, made on June 16th, uh, 1643. And it was meant to bring uh, publishing under government control by creating a sort of offer office of censorship. And authors would have to submit these uh, any written work to these censors in order to have it approved uh, before it was published, before it was even published. Uh, Milton's concern was that this effectively brought the state into a position of authority over for overall thought, gave quasi divine powers to the state. Uh, interestingly. Um, I think it, it, it pre nowadays it seems sort of obvious that uh, what the things that Milton talks about and uh, in, in the 19th century we get a similar defense of, of free speech in John Stuart Mill and it becomes a, definitely a part of the Anglosphere's understanding of academic freedom, free speech, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, as if this were a birthright. But this argument for free speech and the importance of free speech is not a birthright. It is something that has been argued for and won with great difficulty by uh, a few illustrious men, the first of which here is Mr. Milton. Uh, but the arguments that he makes, I think, are uh, better than you will find anywhere. That's my opinion. Uh, it's certainly an impassioned defense. It is, however, not a short defense. You'll have, have read it and think, okay, this is a great essay, and I was persuaded here, and then you kept on going for another 10, and then another 20, and another 30, and another, I mean, <laughs> there's one case, uh, he's heaping up arguments, and all of the arguments, even on their own, are almost persuasive, at least for me, but maybe I'm easily persuaded by the case he's making because I'm with him on this. And, uh, and he's appealing to parliament that has just ruled uh, in the opposite direction. So he's trying to pre persuade people that have just themselves publicly declared that this is the path forward. I will also add that he was unsuccessful in his appeal. The, uh, the censors remained in uh, Parliament and authors did have to publish their uh, or submit their works to the censors working for the Parliament before they were to get their books published. Now that changed but it was a long time after long after the uh, uh, Republic had uh, dissolved. So uh, it's more of interesting, not for its influence in its times, but more for its influence in the history of Western thought, and in particularly for English-speaking peoples, the arguments that he makes uh, become very much a part of our understanding of, of freedom of speech, etc., which I, I will also say is not widely shared around the world and is currently under threat. Uh, around the world with the growing globalization, this, this freedom of speech which comes with uh, um, his distinct understanding of the importance of the truth and the victory of the gospel and how the gospel is only hindered by censorship, these are some of his main arguments, um, that particularly rung forth in the Anglosphere. And as the Anglosphere declines in influence and really in allegiance to its first principles as Milton enunciates them, um, there's a, a growing belief that censorship is necessary to keep people from being triggered or offended uh, and for fake news to be kept from people's hearing so that they might be influenced into bad behavior. Milton will have none of it. There are all sorts of reasons uh, why censorship ought to be brought forward uh, that its proponents propose. Milton is going to confront them all and confute them all. Uh, but let me go to the work itself. I'll uh, argue there, uh, I'll, I'll follow his train of argumentation, so I'm going to use this little 
edition of it here, which I've not ordered for you. I didn't want to add to your burdens of, of cost, but if you wanted to, you could purchase it yourself. This is nice insofar as it's relatively brief. And it is the area of pediatric and of education. Uh, those are the only prose treatises we're going to look at in the class. Uh, I wish we could do more, but uh, we haven't the time. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting here is he, just like in the next prose treatise that we'll look at of education, Milton does not cite his own native traditions. He's, he's not cite, citing British tradition. He's not citing the traditions of, uh, of the Germanic peoples or the Norwegian peoples. In fact, he says right at, at the outset, you esteem it to imitate the old and elegant humanity of Greece rather than the barbaric pride of a Hunnish and Norwegian stateliness. So it's not a, an appeal to Englishness per se, but rather an Englishness that is formed by allegiance to the wisdom uh, that first or was best represented in the Greeks and in particularly in the city of Athens and was passed on uh, through the church and modified by the church, perfected by the church into a Christian understanding of freedom um, thanks to the influence of the gospel. So Greece, Greek learning passes through Roman government into, uh, into Christendom and where, where it, it uh, attains its uh, fairest flower and fruit. So he says, um, he's, so he's going to appeal to that. Now I'll quote the, and, and he knows that of course he's speaking to a hostile audience. When I say hostile, they've already ruled in the opposite direction. And so he needs to, um, and so the case is over. Like it, it's, he's not making an appeal to Parliament to consider his argument while they deliberate. They've already deliberated. They've already pronounced their verdict. And now he's asking them to consider that they may be in error and they should overturn their verdict. As I say, we know that they did not do so. But he is appealing to them to that. So he first says that there can be no greater testimony to their excellence than that uh, their prudent spirit acknowledges and obeys the voice of reason. From what quarter soever it be heard speaking, and renders ye are willing to repeal any act of your own setting forth as any set forth by your predecessors. So it would be, they might feel offended that they were even being challenged on their, their pronouncement, their, their own sense of authority but it would actually praise them all the more that they'd be willing to listen to reason than if they were just simply saying, we've already considered everything that could be considered on this and uh, we're, we're not gonna bother listening. So he appeals to that. And he further says, it will be a fit instance wherein to show both that love of truth which ye eminently profess and that uprightness of your judgment which is not wont to be partial to yourselves by judging over again that order which he have ordained. That is, and he quotes to regulate printing, that no book, pamphlet, or paper shall be henceforth printed unless the same be first approved and licensed by such, or at least one of such as shall be thereto appointed. Now, this was published in, at the height of the English Civil War, by the way. The parliamentarians, on the one hand, are fighting against the royalists. He's appealing to parliament, but there's a war going on. And part of the context of the war is that there is a, not only a, a, a physical battle, there are regularly skirmishes and battles taking place all over England, but there's also a, a war of pamphlets. Opinions are being uh, influenced through these uh, publications. And so there's a threat to the parliamentarian side uh, that the publications of the royalists will undermine their resolve, etc., of their, of their side. So there is a, a real and genuine threat. And it's not just of the royalists. Uh, in Catholic Europe, where Catholicism is the most powerful force, there, there is also a great deal of influence being sought through publications, etc. Et so the English Parliament is trying to uh, close the mouths of their enemies. And they're not, they are their enemies. They're trying to destroy uh, them. 
And in the light of that, Milton nonetheless argues the importance of free speech. As I say, he was unsuccessful in his attempt to persuade them, but he still, it's important to note that he still sought to do, to do so in spite of that. <coughs> uh, it's not meant to be, by, an or, by the way, an oral speech. This was meant to be a pamphlet. And that's interesting in itself because he was thereby defying the edict. Right? He's producing the pamphlet but no, and not passing it by the censors. So he's already, by the mere publication of it, not giving it to the censors, he is already flouting the authority of the censors. He's not going to be censored. He's going to test it by doing it. And are they going to shut him down? Because they know he's on their side. He is one of their most elegant and eloquent spokesmen. But he's defying them. And that's, that is, in itself is interesting. So he's a radical, and he supports, within the parliament, there's a rump called the Presbyterians. There are different uh, uh, Christian uh, Protestant denominations there. There's the dissenters and the levelers and so forth. He is with the Presbyterians at this point. Eventually, he's going to break from the Presbyterians as well, by the way. But at this point, he's supporting the Presbyterians within parliament. Um, but here, he's arguing ag against that and in support of a small group within that um, within that parliament. So um, we should also note that uh, not long before this, uh, the, uh, the censorship that, was, that came from the state, by the way, so the, the parliament is simply repeating a practice that had already been in practice in England before this in the Star Chamber. So, which were courts of law that were created by the monarch to oppress his enemies. There would be a process, an extrajudicial process, in which the judge was also more or less the jury and ex executioner. There was, they were sort of uh, set up by the king to, to shut down his opponents. Um, and so one of Milton's appeals here is the thing that you most hated while you were under the oppression of the king, don't do that same thing yourself now that you have some sort of authority. Okay? So to the argument then. Comments or questions thus far? Yeah. I realize that actually the pamphlets, the essays are, are tougher stuff than the poems. It, it is so, I understand that. Yes? When you say pamphlet, is it like what we think of a pamphlet today with the little threefold? Because this thing is massive. Like now, Pam pamphlets are simply things that were, were written and they would go to a printing press, and the, uh, printing press and then they were repeated and they could be very lengthy. Would they be handed out on the street? Yes, or yes. Like the newspapers would be? Uh, they would be probably selectively handed to people that they thought would be um, willing to consider them. Um, and obviously in this case it's an, elite, it's an act that goes against the edict of parliament. So I think you might want to be careful who you would give that to because you could be arrested for distributing unlawful material, et cetera. But I'm not exactly sure of the mechanics of that. But a pamphlet is simply, a, rather than a book that's bound, it's just uh, extended essays that are handed around. Yeah. So as if it were to be read out in Parliament, but he didn't speak in Parliament and is speaking to Parliamentarians. So it would have worked their way, his way into the hands of parli probably the Parliament itself. And presumably, the Presbyterians would then be arguing against the majority that were, had been in favor of this. I don't know about that exactly, but that's it. Now, he's going to make three uh, types of arguments there. And this is, it is on page five of, if you had this copy, if not, I'm just saying that for reference here. But he says he's making three types of appeals. First of all, he's going to make a historical argument which is that the inventors of uh, censorship are those that you would be loath to own. So you're going to associate with the worst sorts of people, the people that you as, uh, as Protestants and upholders of the truth will want nothing to do with. That's where censorship originates. He's going to argue that it originates with the medieval Catholic Church. But I'll, I'll get to that more specifically in a minute. 
and is then brought about through, uh, through the Inquisition. And there's a uh, codex of banned books and an index of books that have been censured, that has had parts cut out that the censors didn't like, and then they're published. So don't do what the Romans just did to you while you have freedom to uh, bring about a breach from the problems of the Catholic Charles I, or the Catholic friendly Charles I. But I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So that's, there's gonna be a historical argument you're associating with those that are actually the oppressors of truth and you're the upholders of truth. Secondly, what is to be thought in general of reading? Whatever sort of books the, the books be and that this order avails nothing to the suppressing of scandalous, seditious and libelous books which were mainly intended to be suppressed. So the effect of censorship, it, it's ineffective. You're going to try and do this and it's going to fail. He's going to make that argument, that type of argument. One, it began so the origins are bad and the people that have used censorship historically are those you don't want to be associated with. Secondly, you're going to try and ban bad books and you'll fail in doing that. And here's why. And then thirdly and lastly, it will primarily, the effect will be not only ineffective but iniquitous. It will discourage all learning and stop the truth, not only by disexercising his phrase and blunting our abilities in that we know in what we know already, but by hindering and cropping the discovery that might be yet further made, both in religious and civil wisdom. So it will stop the pursuit of learning. So not only it won't it will be ineffective in stopping the mouths of the bad guys, it's going to muzzle yourselves. This is going to be turned back against you. So don't do it. But th those are the three types of arguments he outlines it, uh, right towards the outset of the whole pamphlet. He begins with this fantastic and famous quote. And I'm going to, I'm going to read lengthy extracts from the Areopagitica in part because I realize it's hard to read. And I think it's actually easier to understand if it's read aloud. And probably if I read it aloud, you might actually find that it comes to life a little bit more. But So I'm going to do it whether it does or not. You, you can tell me afterwards. But he will say, and this is again a famous quotation, books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are. Nay, they do preserve as in a vial the purest efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them. I know they are as lively and as vigorously productive as those fabulous dragon's teeth, and being sewn up and down may chance to spring up armed men of Cadmus. So it's the myth of Cadmus, sewed the dragon's teeth and they grew up as men. So books have a potency that allows the author to speak uh, beyond his own particular context and situation and, and, and can exercise a, uh, a force of persuasion well beyond the uh, limitations of his own voice. If he were just a man speaking, the book can be read anywhere and everywhere. Right, and the Protestant Reformation to some degree has demonstrated this fact, that books allow authors that wrote in the past to continue to exercise and speak in our presence today. That's more or less what he is arguing, but this, he continues with the metaphor, and yet on the other hand, unless wariness be used, as good almost kill a man, as kill a good book. Who kills a man kills a reasonable creature, God's image. But he who destroys a good book kills reason itself kills the image of God, as it were, in the eye. So it's almost worse to destroy a good book than it is to destroy even a good man. Because a good man's meditations, when he writes them down, are, he's basically crystallizing his best thoughts and the best words and putting them down for posterity's sake. It's interesting to my mind that uh, 
even in the Gospels, we have the accounts of Jesus' life. We actually only have mostly the accounts of three years of his life. And we don't even have all of those three years. We have uh, sermons. We have uh, wise sayings. We have um, proverbial things. We have sarcasm. We have a variety. But we don't have everything that Jesus said. We do have what the apostles and, and uh, the uh, gospel writers chose to write down for us. So that it's, a, it's a crystallization of what Jesus would have said while he was walking the earth. I've heard people say, if only Jesus were in my midst, then I would, un- I would be able to ask my questions and I would understand and I would follow him. I'd be able to peel, peel directly to Jesus. Well, Jesus, who is God, decided that this is how his truth was going to be proclaimed beyond his life. And, and no, knowing that uh, it would be written down and through the work of the person of the Holy Spirit that that truth would be effective beyond his earthly life and ministry. So great example there of what Mr. Milton is talking about there. But he, so he says, many a man lives a burden to the earth, but a good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. Tis true, no age can restore life, whereof perhaps there is no great loss, and revolutions of ages do not oft recover the loss of a rejected truth, for the want of which whole nations fare the worse. We should be wary, therefore, what persecution we raise against the living labors of public men, that is, men who publish. How we spill that seasoned life of a man preserved and stored up in books, since we see a kind of homicide may be thus committed, sometimes a martyrdom, and if extended to the whole impression, a kind of massacre, whereof the execution ends not in the slaying of an elemental life, but strikes at that ethereal and fifth essence, the breath of reason itself, slays an immortality rather than a life. So strong words, it's obviously flowery rhetorical language. He's, he's creating an, a, a, a mental image in the reader's mind, but his, he's making a strong case. And the case that he's making, which he will uh, expand upon, is the importance of reason. And right reason. And the power of truth to vanquish its enemies on the plane of battle. Look, if truth is able uh, if truth is, if God is truth, which Jesus declares he is, and if truth can vanquish falsehoods and break down strongholds and destroy every pretense of argument, etc., then why on earth would you want to allow what ends up being people in authority judging over truth and determining, trying to weaken their enemy, when really their greatest strength is in simply allowing the truth to be proclaimed. It's a powerful argument. It, it, and it's born there in a historical moment of what precisely happened in, um, in England itself. So that uh, you'll know that um, uh, William Tyndale sought to translate the uh, Bible into English and was executed for it because he was bringing the truth to the common people and the church sought to prevent that from happening. This is by implication he's suggesting to these men who are Protestants uh, you're, you are in danger of doing precisely the same thing and the weapon that you have forged here will be used against you and against those who are your uh, best representatives, namely, namely men like Mr. Milton. He fears being censored. He already has been censored, by the way, for his uh, pamphlet on divorce, which I think is a garbage treatise, but never, that's, that's by the by. The argument, that is. It's well written as everything he writes, but. Um, so then he goes through a, so it's reason itself that will be killed by, by banning books because it, it is through books that reason is cultivated, as has always been cultivated. Uh, so then he goes through a historical 
ar not just an argument, but, a, but through this uh, re recounting of how books have been used throughout um, history. He doesn't cover all of history, but those of the, the most esteemed for wisdom. And he, so he starts in Athens. And I quote, in Athens, where books and wits were ever busier than in any other part of Greece, I find but only two sorts of writings which the magistrate cared to take notice of. Those either blasphemous and atheistical, on the one hand, or libelous. Thus were the books of Protagoras, uh, by the judges of Areopagus, commanded to be burnt and himself banished the territory because he said he, he wasn't sure whether there were gods or not. That, that was the reason. He was an we would say he was an agnostic. That was sufficient, that he should doubt such things. Um, but he will note here that in Athens, um, uh, the uh, censorship did not take place. So we do not read that either Epicurus or the, that libertine school of Cyrene, uh, or what the cynic impudence uttered was ever questioned by the laws. So the laws never shut down the writings of these characters as iniquitous as they were considered. So for all of the falsehood with which they were rightly charged, uh, the writings of these schools were ne uh, of philosophy were never uh, legislated against, and neither were the ancient comedies. You could, they were forbidden from acting the plays of the ancient comedies, because they, what, what they would do is they put politicians of the day on the stage and then do terrible things to them, like awful things. And, and uh, uh, Socrates himself got this sort of treatment. Like, I'm not sure next semester when I deal with practical criticism whether we're going to get to uh, the form of drama in the ancient comedies, but uh, th these were they were vulgar performances, and the politicians of the day were treated. If you think Donald Trump's getting a bad treatment in the press, you should read ancient comedies. What happened to the politicians of their day? I mean, they're getting humiliated on stage in a, just a disgraceful way, like be scandalized. Um, context forbids me from going into the details here, but it's pretty salacious. Um, and, and even Plato commended the reading of Aristophanes, who was the, he was the most vulgar of all the ancient comedians. And Plato uh, recommended censorship in a book called The Laws, which, by the way, nobody ever followed in any republic ever. So Plato wrote a book on the laws called Laws, and no city or state ever has implemented his view of censorship which is itself instructive. Um, then he goes on to the Romans and talks about, about uh, their influence. I'll come to the Christian age. When rem the emperors became Christians, uh, the books of those whom they took to be grand heretics were examined, refuted, and condemned in the general councils, and not till then were prohibited or burnt by the authority of the emperor. So they were first allowed to be published. And then they were examined. And then they, uh, a council would be brought together to discuss it. And only after the council had rendered its verdict were they to receive censorship. So Milton's not, from, from this precedent, Milton is not arguing against censorship entirely simply that censorship should take place after it's open to public dispute. It can be refuted. The falsehood can be seen. So he's not saying that, that falsehood and iniquity should be allowed to flourish without any opposition, simply that it should not be nipped in the bud by some government council. You have to submit everything to that in order for it to be published. Because that will be used to simply to shut down the voices of your enemies at that point. And so it goes on to say, the primitive councils and bishops, that is the early church, church fathers, were wont only to declare what books were not commendable, 
passing no further, but leaving it to each one's conscience to read or lay by. Very interesting. So even in the early patristic age, uh, the books that were um, promoting the worship of heathen gods, as they would have seen them, and in, in Augustine's words, the gods of the Greeks were, were demons in disguise. He still would not have um, censored or disallowed those books to be read. They just simply were not to be recommended by Christians as worthy. But that doesn't mean they, they couldn't be read or shouldn't be read. And it's quite clear that they were read. And he's going to go on to talk more about this. And it's only, by, it's only with Martin V, who's a pope, 1417 to 1431, that he prohibited and, uh, and then by pain of excommunication, the reading of heretical books. At the time of John Wycliffe, uh, Wycliffe College downtown named after him, and, and uh, Jan Hus, a Czech reformer, early reformers before the Reformation. So, it's only, so there's a stricter policy of prohibition in the late and corrupt medieval Catholic Church. Only at that point does censorship come into the church. And that not only did they stop there in matters heretical, any subject that was not to their palate, they either condemned in a prohibition or it had to go through an index. So it had to be the, the, the offensive bits were uh, edited out in a sort of a uh, PG version of the book. Only at that late stage, but, but those who uh, were accounted with wisdom, both the Greeks and then later in the church, even the church fathers, that the, the most they would do is recommend uh, that you read these books, but they would not say or burn the writing of pagans or heretics. And thus we have writings of, of authors like Ovid, for instance, his Metamorphoses and his Amores and so forth, which are scandalous works. I mean, sexual infidelity, lying amongst the, constantly. Um, we have them to this day, we read them in our classes. Uh, it's not the truth that's recommend, being recommended, it's a type of falsehood that is being demonstrated. And Milton will come to that uh, in a minute. So, therefore, and so thus ye, now he's speaking, addressing the Parliament again, have the inventors in the original of book licensing ripped up and drawn as lineally as any pedigree. We have it not that can be heard of from any ancient state, any ancient state, none of them has banned books or polity, or church, nor any statute left us by our ancestors, elder or later, nor from the modern custom of any reformed ch city or church abroad, but from the most anti-Christian council. That is the Council of Trent, the Catholic of his day, he, which he calls anti-Christian, because it opposes the authority of Christ, declares the supremacy of Pope, of the Pope over the councils and even over, over scripture. This is, anti, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Pope, he's he's spe, spe, speaking to uh, an audience here of parliamentarians that is wholly going to be with him on this. He isn't making an argument. He understands that they are with him on this point. But from the most anti-Christian council and the most tyrannous inquisition that ever inquired. Till then, books were ever as freely admitted into the world as any other birth. The issue of the brain was no more stifled than the issue of the womb. No envious Juno sat cross-legged over the nativity of any man's intellectual offspring. But if it proved a monster, who denies but that it was justly burnt or sunk into the sea? So once again, once it's been demonstrated to be monstrous, at that point, of course, by all means, burn it. If it undermines the faith in iniquitous fashions, if the effect is such that it can be de demonstrated as such uh, by scripture, then by all means, but not before it uh, is published and open to public viewing. And then goes on these wonderful world words, but that a book in worse condition than a peccant soul, that is a sinful soul, should be to stand before a jury ere it be born to the world and undergo, yet in darkness, 
the judgments of Radamanth, one of the gods of the underworld in Virgil, and his colleagues, ere it can pass the fairy backward into light, was never heard before, till that mysterious iniquity provoked and troubled at the first entrance of reformation, sought out new limbos and new hells, wherein they might include our books, also within the number of their damned. So had we, so this is the policy of Rome when it was most anti-Christ. Just because you're under threat, military threat, don't muzzle the truth. Because the truth has already brought you to prevail over your enemies here in this country. Don't use this means and think that it is, so it's like the ring of power, you cannot use it. To use an analogy from Tolkien, that you cannot wield this. It will destroy you. Some will say, but then, so then he goes on, and this is typical of rhetoric, to he invites uh, possible objections to the thesis that he's just put forward, which is a good form of argumentation, by the way. You can use it in your own essays. I would, I would uh, recommend it, in fact, if you have space to do so. So you present your thesis, and then you imagine counterpoints, arguments that somebody might state against your thesis. Let them be brought forward as strongly as you can and then refute them, and that's what he does. He imagines objections. Some will say that though the inventors were bad, the thing for all that may be good. It may so. Okay, let's say it may so. Yet, if all, if that thing be no such deep invention, but obvious and easy for any man to light on, and yet best and wisest commonwealths throughout all ages and occasions have forborne to use it, and the falsest seducers and oppressors of men were the first who took it up, and to no other purpose but to obstruct and hinder the first approach of reformation, I am those who believe it will be harder alchemy than Lullius ever knew to sublimate any good use out of such an invention. So no, again, he's, he's recapitulating what he's just said. Well, if that's the case, then why then has nobody ever used it? And it was censorship was only ever used at the very point when Reformation was being brought about in the church, and it was used by those who wanted to stop it from happening. Only then was censorship used. Only then were people asked to submit their, their works uh, prior to publication for publication to the authorities. And then he goes on to a great biblical argument. Not to insist upon the examples of Moses, Daniel, and Paul, who were skillful in all the learning of the Egyptians, uh, Chaldeans, and Greeks, which could not probably be without reading their books of all sorts, uh, in Paul especially, who thought it no defilement to insert into Holy Scripture the sentences of three Greek poets, and one of them a tragedian. The question was notwithstanding sometimes controverted among the primitive doctors, but with great odds on that side which affirmed it both lawful and profitable, as was then evidently perceived when Julian the Apostate, who was an emperor and subtlest enemy to our faith, made a decree forbidding Christians the study of heathen learning. Isn't that interesting? Christians may not study the pagan books in the, in the Roman schools. Why? because they're confuting it. They're, by learning what the pagans are teaching, they're learning to confute and refute what they are reading. So therefore, we're going to prevent them from learning. So isn't that interesting? So, so he calls them the subtlest enemy uh, of the faith. And he said, he, they wound us with our own weapons, and with our own arts and sciences, they overcome us. So this is the antithetical argument to the one that Augustine makes in, uh, on Christian doctrine, uh, whereby he, he says that uh, the Christians are to be like the ancient Hebrew people coming out of Egypt to plunder the Egyptians and take their knowledge and learning and use it for Christian good. Here's the, here's the same case being made, but from the opposite vantage point. Uh, the Julian the Apostate forbids Christians to learn from the pagans because when they do so, they use their own tools against them and win. So let's learn from the apostate. He doesn't want us to read bad books.
And indeed, the Christians were put so to their shifts by this crafty means and so much endangered to decline into all ignorance that the two Apollinari Apol were fain, as man, a man may say, to coin all the seven liberal sciences out of the Bible, reducing it into diverse forms of orations, poems, dialogues, even to the calculating of a new Christian grammar. Then talks about other church fathers. And then he adds another argument. This is going on a different angle. And he might have added another remarkable saying of that same author's. This is uh, Paul the Apostle. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Paul writing to the Th Thessalonians. Prove all things. How do you prove them? By reading them. Considering them. Testing them. And he might have added another remarkable saying. To the pure, all things are pure. Not only meats and drinks, but all kinds of knowledge, whether of good or evil, the knowledge cannot defile, nor consequently the books, if the will and the conscience be not defiled. For books are as meats and viands are, some of good, some of evil substance. So there's good food and there's bad food. Food, Of course there is. Some's been sacrificed to demons. Does Paul say you can eat of those things? If your conscience is not uh, bridling at the thought, yes, you may. On the other hand, if you have a weaker brother in your midst, perhaps you would refrain for his sake because he might be upset and offended by it. But it's not going to harm you. He extends that by analogy to the intellectual realm. Books are as meats and viands, some of good, some of evil substance. And yet God, in that unapocryphal vision, said, without, ex without exception, rise, Peter, kill and eat, leaving the choice to each man's discretion. Wholesome meats to a vitiated stomach, so if you've got a bad digestion, uh, differ little or nothing from unwholesome. You're going to have an upset stomach, whether it's good food or bad food, if you've got a bad stomach. And the best books, to a naughty mind, are not uh, unappliable to occasions of evil. Some people read the Bible and it makes them worse. We witness that in the academy at large. The book itself uh, has a potency, but it, it, it actually does not, in the reading of itself, does in and of itself does not make bad men good. in and of itself, without the work of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then he goes on, bad meats will scarce breed good nourishment in the healthiest concoction, but herein the difference is of bad books, that they, to a discreet and judicious reader, serve in many respects to discover, to, uh, 